Right, well, we may as well make a start. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm George Hay, Associate Editor of Reuters Breaking Views uh, in London. Uh, the title of this session is MENA Building the Next Fintech Hub. And we've got a great panel of experts to um, kick some of these ideas around. So I'll um, introduce them. Um, first of all, we have Marcelo Jugale. He's Director of the Financial Advisory and Banking Department of the World Bank. Uh, his team helps developing companies manage their reserves, uh, lighten their debts, and hedge their risks. And he spent uh, almost 30 years uh, doing that kind of thing. Um, next to him is Ben Lorsky. Um, well, while New York State's Superintendent of Financial Services between uh, 2011 and 2015, uh, Ben developed quite a reputation as the kind of scourge of the um, banks, particularly UK banks, as they found to their costs. Um, probably meant that he was doing his job. Um, <laughs> Uh, he's now uh, Head of Regulatory Affairs for the New York Digital Investment Group and a visiting scholar at Stanford University's Cyber Institute. Uh, next to him is uh, uh, Khalid Saad. He formerly worked at the Bahrain Economic Development Board. Um, he's now CEO of Bahrain Fintech Bay, which is, also, which is one of the key fintech players in the Middle East. And right at the end uh, is Richard Tang, CEO of the Financial Services Authority, uh, Regulatory Authority at Abu Dhabi Global Market. Um, Richard's an especially good person to talk about this kind of stuff because he's, he used to work in Singapore, which is very progressive on uh, fintech issues. And um, ADGM is also one of the key um, Middle East markets who have already set up a sandbox. And if you don't know what that is, we'll come on to it. Um, so, right, first of all, let's kind of define some terms. Um, when we say the word fintech, Ben, what do we mean? What do you understand that to mean? Sure. Well, thank you first for having me, and thank you to the Milken Institute for inviting me. Um, uh, fintech, I define generally broadly. Uh, we certainly did when I was a regulator. Um, sort of any new technology that is changing the face of financial services is something we started to see when I was back at the Department of Financial Services, 2011, 12, 13. Um, you could see this collision of this very unregulated world of technology, and unregulated for good reason. We want to yeah. promote innovation, uh, colliding with this very tightly regulated world of financial services. And I think for policymakers, that's the real challenge, and for regulators, the collision of that unregulated world with the very regulated world, what comes out of it. And that's what we struggle with. It's probably what we're going to talk about today. Absolutely, yeah. Um, uh, Richard, what about um, hub? Obviously, everyone knows what hub means, but in a fintech sense, what does it, you know, what, what is, how big do you need to be to be a hub? And um, how should we think about that? Well, I think a very simple definition is uh, any place where you have activities taking place, where people want to conduct activities, where there's certainty of law, certainty of rules and regulations, where you have rules and regulations that can evolve ra rapidly to allow new innovation, new activities to take place, and supporting the growth of the startups, those in acceleration, as well as existing incumbents looking to deploy solutions. I think any ecosystem that's able to do all those things well will develop into a hub, be it in terms of fintech or other hubs. Right? So okay, that's, that's, a very, that's, very, that's very useful. Yeah. And then, uh, Marcelo, um, the MENA region, um, maybe you could just give a bit of context as to, um, obviously, it's a pretty diverse place. Mm -hmm. um, realistically, when we talk about the possibilities of a, a fintech hub, um, where are we talking about um, and where are we talking about less, I suppose? Well, let me also define the MENA region. No? Um, for us, is everything that goes from Syria to Yemen and from Morocco to Iraq. So it's very, very heterogeneous, certainly from the point of view of economic development and certainly from the point of view of having any fintech. Um, the good news is that for us, the financial innovations that fintech brings um, have behind them value chains. You can break down crowdsourcing, mobile wallets, peer-to-peer -peer transfers, uh, digital currencies, e-trading. You can roll advice. You can break it down in components. You know? So you have the design and coding. You have the data gathering. You have the security. You have the hardware maintenance. You have the customer service. Try to call customer service in Uber, see whether you speak to somebody. Um, 
So you have all these components that give us hope that perhaps the laggards in the MENA region could latch on to some of these. Right, right. Okay? Uh, for example, if one of the components, customer service, requires English speaker or French speakers uh, with a high level of education, then you have some countries in MENA that could cater for that. Right. Okay? Now, they may not be able to cater for coding or design because they still don't have neither the intellectual property protection, uh, they may not have the skills, uh, they may not have the collocation of innovators and incubators, but they may do the other part. Okay, well, we, we can come on to that. Um, the, um, Carly, I'm not going to leave you out of the definition uh, fun. So I'm, I guarantee you there will be people sitting in this audience going, um, why are you talking about sandboxes? What the hell is a sandbox? Um, so can you shed some light on um, what that particularly is? Yeah, sure. Um, I think in the context of financial services, obviously, it was a concept that was pioneered by the FCA and pretty much it's a light touch regulatory environment where either existing financial institutions, fintechs, professional service bodies or others that have a new innovative idea, which doesn't quite fall under an existing licensing regime, can be tested, incubated under a controlled environment where that concept is being tested to see whether there's also viability, also at the same time for the regulator to better understand how best to regulate this technology, or in, some, in certain cases, maybe not even license. By the yeah. end of the experiment, you might not need to license it. And I think what happened is that has allowed new players to come into the financial services sector where, where the barriers for decades were, were very high, and you just had a particular type of institution that was allowed in. So mm -hmm. yeah. it has allowed for significant innovation to start coming into financial services. Right. So, Ben, back to you. Um, starting from, given what Carl Ed just said, I mean, sandboxes sound like a pretty great idea, a um, pretty great way to um, encourage innovation. Um, but they haven't necessarily gone down that well um, in your home patch in, in the US. Can you just kind of shed a bit of light on why that is and what you think of um, the... <laughs> of sandboxes in the US? Yeah, look, it's been, um, it's been a little disappointing to watch. Um, sandboxes haven't taken off in the US the way they have in other parts of the globe, like here. Um, and I think it's for a number of reasons. One is regulators have a, a lot to do in the US um, to catch up and to get educated on these new technologies. That education takes a while. I think there's a little bit of denial that regulators go through also when they see <clears throat> newfangled things coming into their offices and they have lots of other things to worry about. I remember when I first heard about cryptocurrencies mm. during the Cyprus crisis and I think it was 2013, young economist walks into my office, starts telling me all about it and I was, you know, I, my initial reaction was, I got other things I need to worry about, <laughs> not this. Um, I think over time I was convinced that it was important to focus on that and it was important to focus on fintech. I think regulators in the U.S. are going through that process of realizing this is real, it's here to stay, it's fundamentally changing financial services over the next you know, 5, 10, 20 years, and if you don't deal with it as a regulator, you're just going to be having to run faster to catch up later. And that's what worries me, is that uh, new technologies are obviously accelerating away from policymakers and regulators, and we need to do a much better job as a policymaking regulatory community to catch up. Um, the CFPB in the U.S. is trying. Um, Trump administration has slowed that agency down in general, so I don't know how that will end up playing out. There are a couple states like Arizona that have really stepped up. They've, they've set up a sandbox. They have, and, yeah. and people are, the companies I've talked to are pretty happy with it. Um, it's pretty open. And I think the key is, and this is how I would have thought about it, sandboxes really weren't the thing when I was a regulator. They kind of came afterwards. But I, my view is you put a set of guardrails in place uh, basic requirements you need from any financial services company that's holding the assets of others mm. um, that we would all expect uh, to have. And then you, you, let them, you let the companies run an experiment and you hopefully create uh, a race to the top where companies are fulfilling their regulatory obligations, uh, the, you know, the base that you set for them, but then they're um, competing to innovate uh, within the jurisdiction. And um, it can be done. I mean, we do it in the US with drug trials. The FDA does a, a fine job, of, usually, of allowing companies to, bring new dr to test new drugs under controlled circumstances uh, because they bring great benefits. I don't see why, at both a federal and a state level in the US, we can't do the same. 
Um, but, I mean, there, there must be a reason why, I mean, you've kind of stated some of the reason why your uh, successor at the DFS, Maria uh, Vulo, said toddlers play in sandboxes, adults play by the rules. Um, and it's presumably about um, the, I mean, post-financial crisis, there's an understandable regulatory concern about anything newfangled that could then cause another um, problem. I mean, yeah, I, th look, I think I, some of I James Bullard has actually said it's going to be the, co the next fintech, cause of the next fintech, uh, the, the next financial crisis, fintech, which yeah, I, I, I don't, <laughs> seems a bit excessive. I, I don't. I think it's excessive. I think that was a poor turn of phrase. I wouldn't have said it myself. Um, I think, uh, you know, it's a play on the word sandbox. What we mean by sandbox is obviously not a place to to play with no rules. It's a place to allow innovation, but you have real rules. Um, none of us would want to see a, an NBA or a soccer game, football game, with no rules at all. Mm -hmm. It would get out of control. It wouldn't be the best team winning. Um, I always thought of my job as a regulator to be like a really good NBA referee. The best ones, they're out there, they enforce the rules, but for most of the time, you don't notice them. Yeah. Um, there are clear rules. Everyone knows if you commit a flagrant foul, it gets called. Uh, and the whistle blows, but then the game goes on. And other than that, if you play within the rules, go for it and, 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 and experiment right. and, and succeed. I just wondered, uh, Richard, from your perspective, from the outside looking in and looking at um, the US system, what, what, how do you assess it as a um, place for fintech innovation? Well, I th I, my take is that it is complicated to get a proper regulatory sandbox in order in the States because you have federal level regulations, you have state level regulations, yeah. and you, for many of the new fintechs that's coming through in terms of technology, their services cut across more than one regulator. And that's the case, you need proper coordination among the regulators to see what's the risk that you bring to the marketplace in the banking, in, in the capital market sector, in the payment space, etc. And you can't quite bring about that tight coordination. The other issue in the States, the way I look at it, is at the policy-making level. Are you funding, providing enough funding into that space? Because to regulate the fintechs, even within the sandbox itself, you need adequate expertise in the various areas, mm -hmm. in terms of AI, DLTs, blockchain. You need to devote time, resources, energy, yeah. and you need resources. So the policymakers must make sure the relevant agencies in the States have those sort of resources to recruit talent, to retain those talent, to understand the risk and regulate the different areas respectively. Right, okay. Uh, look, I just want to emphasize that. It's a great point. If you have 30 seconds for sure. a story, I mean, I saw this firsthand. I remember in 2013 or 14, turned out I have a mutual friend with a guy I didn't know at the time, but I got a message from him, a guy named Jack Dorsey, and the message was, I don't want any special treatment, but you have an application pending in your building, 1,400 people, uh, for a license for a company I really hadn't heard of yet called Square. And could you just find out what's going on? We've been waiting a year. Trust so I went down into the bowels of the place and met with the team that was working on it. And I said, do you have this application? And they said, yeah, it's great. It's really interesting. Great company. We're working on it. I said, well, I heard it's been pending a year. What's going on? And these are people that have been at DFS where I worked for you know, well over uh, probably 20 years each. They've been doing their business a certain way. Uh, they weren't trained in these new technologies, as Richard mentioned. And I said to them, what's the problem then? If it looks good, let's move it along. And they said, well, they keep updating their application. That's usually a telltale sign that there's a problem. And I said, oh, well, why are they updating it? And what's the problem? And they said, well, their software keeps changing. They keep innovating. <laughs> and I, I said, yeah, that's what they do. They're a tech company. I said, so how often are they changing, updating the software? They said, well, they're doing it every, I think it was every four months. And I said, and how long does it take to get through your typical process? Six months. And what are you doing every time they update it? Well, we're putting them at the back of the line. <laughs> and they're looking at me, and I'm looking at them, and I'm sort of saying, you know, they're never going to get out of the line if you keep putting them at the back every right. four months. And uh, that was just a great example of the agency and the people within it had not figured out this new thing yet. We obviously changed it. We got that application done. When I asked them, do you have other applications like this? Like, oh, yeah, Facebook, you know, a whole bunch of other <laughs> major tech uh, companies were doing interesting things. Yeah. yeah, fair enough. But so um, the resources is a great point. That, that, that is a great point. Um, so just, uh, I mean, I'm interested from, from all members of the panel, let's start with Richard because he's the Singapore experience. Um, would you describe Singapore as a kind of... Um, 
jurisdiction that's got it kind of right on these, in the balance. What, the, what we're really talking about here is a balance, balance between innovation and financial stability. Have they got it right? And if they haven't, who else have? I'm interested in all views. So. Well, I'm from Singapore, so I used to work in the Monetary Authority of Singapore, so I could be quite biased. But MES itself has done a fantastic job in the area of supporting growth, innovation, while addressing risk at the same time. So, so you look at the history of Singapore, it has a very short history. Uh, 50 years of independence, going from a third world country to first world, one of the few countries in the world that has managed to grow its financial services sector quite successfully without any big scandals, uh, any big blow-ups, because it focuses on risk, addressing all the key important areas of risk to make sure nothing big grow blows up. But at the same time, supporting that growth and innovation, having clarity of rules, allowing people to come to them and talk to them, find out more areas that they don't understand, they'll they go and learn and find out more. I think, I think that's great, which is why they just won Central Bank of the Year for also their work on fintech. And if you attend the fintech festival in Singapore, we're just commenting about it, it has become the largest gathering in the world in mm -hmm. that space. So it has done quite a lot of things, including appointing a chief technological officer, a chief fintech officer, a chief data officer within MES, looking at all these things. But the other thing that is in MES's favour, which doesn't quite exist elsewhere, it is a sole single regulatory agency, right. looking across banking, insurance, capital markets, responsible for financial centre development. And because of that, it can do a lot of things. So it's so slightly different from the, the US, That's slightly different example, from the, you're, almost you're the, the rest of the world. You can come up with agenda on national IDs. You can come up with rules on data residency that cuts across the entire industry, outsourcing policy in terms of cloud, in terms of shared services, educational policy, talent development. Those are extremely important. So it wears that whole of government hat, which is extremely important in that development. Right. And Carly, would you, you would presumably agree with that. Is there, are there any other kind of models around the world that you think are, you know, you know examples that you follow in Bahrain? Or? I, I think I completely agree with, with Richard. I think uh, the, the point he emphasized on being a single regulator is extremely important. And obviously, in Bahrain, we do have a single regulator, different scale, obviously, than the Monetary Authority of Singapore, but we saw them also as a, a, a proper reference point in terms of what can be achieved. Obviously, we're a small country like Singapore, so there are some very similar dynamics. I think also what the FCA has done has to be admired. And I think, you know, they've literally set the way for the rest of the world to really look at what innovation and regulations for fintech are. I think the Australian also Securities Commission is, is actually very progressive. Um, but, I, but I think what Singapore has done very well, and I think there are key lessons for us here in the region, whether it's Abu Dhabi, Bahrain, or elsewhere, is how can you create a proper platform from which, you know, you've got the indigenous industry starting to, to thrive, mm. uh, innovate, um, but also at the same time being that platform, and I emphasize the word platform because to me, hub could have a physical side, but I think more importantly is that platform which connects you to a much wider network. Um, they've managed to do that very successfully, and I think therein lies the, the power in terms of what they did and the key takeaways f for us here in the region. So I think yeah. if I had to single-handedly now uh, if you asked me a few years ago, maybe the answer was no. Choose a proper reference point for what could be achieved. I would have to agree that it's a Singapore. And for us in Bahrain, we've taken a lot of the key learnings. And obviously, you've got to localize it because yeah. some of the things need to make a lot of sense for your jurisdiction. Yeah, that, that's, that's very interesting. I mean, just, um, just, so yeah. just, to, just to butt in, where, like, where, does, where, does China for, for, where does China fit in this? Because, I mean, people tend to, innovation-wise, there's quite a lot of innovation going on in China, but it's a, is, that a, is that in any way a model um, for what you do, for what they do there? Well, if I can just give you a take, a comparison of what is happening in the Western Hemisphere versus some of the emerging countries and why is it happening in China in a certain fashion. So if you look at Western Hemisphere, you have certain preconceived notion of what a bank looks like, mm. of what payments are, how do you write a check, right? 
since you're a kid, you go to a bank, you deposit money. So there's preconceived notion. The, the rules and regulations, the lines are very drawn. You have powerful yeah. financial institutions, powerful lobby group. Anytime new changes take place, those power groups, lobby groups, will stop some of those things. Right? So those, those are what you see in the Western Hemisphere. In China, and in certain parts or right, different parts of Africa, some emerging countries, you don't have those preconceived notions. Mm. You don't have preconceived notion of how payment should be made, what a bank should look like, uh, how should financial transaction be taken, which is why the likes of Alibaba, WePay, WeBank, Jingdong, they have all really started off very small, but they have been transformational, right. and they are able to change mm. that space. Coupled with that, the Chinese regulators have allowed them to grow first to a certain level before they come in with regulations because they want to see where it goes. They don't understand enough and they say it doesn't quite pose systemic risk at this point in time, so let's not regulate them, let's allow them to innovate. So you're seeing a lot of those innovations. But in more developed jurisdiction, I do not think that can take place as easily. So a tech-dominant world, is what you're going to see in some of these emerging countries, right? So in the tech, mm. the tech players are going to be very big. But in the Western Hemisphere, in most developed countries, it's still going to be a financial institution's dominant role going forward that uses technology to harness service offerings. That That's you see. Yeah. Mm. Um, just Marcelo, um, just, for, just um, from a kind of macro perspective, um, what, what do you kind of, what are the kind of preconditions do you think you need for, um, if we're going to set up a, um, a hub here. And, uh, what are the kind of kind of non fintechy bits that you would need? Like presumably the tax system and things like that are important. Well, let me say we, we get into these because we smell that it could be the answer to youth unemployment and to financial inclusion, hmm. particularly for uh, small enterprises and for rural populations, what we call hard to reach. So we went and checked on the now. I have brand new data on this, by the way. It just came out in November. Um, taking stock of the 55 uh, fintech hubs in the world. And then we cut that data and look at the ones that belong to the emerging and developing countries and said what made it possible. Now, the kind of countries I have in mind are not China or India. It's rather Uruguay, uh, Mexico, Mauritius, Estonia. Uh, and you say, well, why did it happen here in, say, Uruguay and not across the river in Argentina or in Estonia and not yet in Lithuania, yeah. no? And frankly, what we find is first, it's three components uh, and you need them all. This is like Italian spaghetti. You need the pasta, the sauce and the Parmesano cheese. Otherwise, not yeah. Italian spaghetti. It's <laughs> much more complicated than that. So that's very complicated. <laughs> but the first is the macro framework. This is not going to happen in an economy where the capital account is closed and you cannot repatriate benefits, profits. Uh, you need a clear tax system. Uh, it can be floating around, it has to be clear. Even if it's high marginal rates, it has to be clear. And you need open trade. You need to m move equipment all the time. Um, so that's a macro framework. Then you need the enabling factors, as we call them. Uh, the talent, the skills, the universities, however you want to call that, people that have the brains and the talent to do these things. Access to capital, the startups in particular, can venture capital is coming in and out easily. Um, and finally, the infrastructure. You need penetration of the internet at a high speed. Now, the third component, the Parmigiano, is exactly what was mentioned before, is the regulatory and legal framework. Can it catch up fast enough? No? The regulators are the cheese. The regulators okay. are the cheese. Uh, <laughs> not literally. Well, they, they smell a bit. You, know, they, yeah. you can tell when it's not there. Uh, let me say there, there are two particular portions of the legal framework that matter a lot. One is data privacy. Uh, right. If you cannot protect that, it won't happen. Uh, and the other one is um, IP protection, intellectual property protection. Now ask yourself why uh, Nairobi, together with Cape Town, are the only two fintech hubs in the whole of Africa, including North Africa. And only Tel Aviv and Dubai are the only fintech hubs in the whole of MENA, meaning Middle East and Africa, is because that last bit, uh, the Parmesan cheese, if you want, was there. No? Uh, now, hope is eternal, and we think some countries are now coming up. As I say, Uruguay is very promising for this. 
It has the three components and it's using them. And I should say the whole thing is embraced in a political will. You know? People want to do these mm. things. The government is always supporting, always speaking about it, uh, giving resources to the regulators so they can move faster than every six months. Um, so this thing is moving. In some emerging countries, people are seeing it as the employment engine of the future. That's very interesting. So um, you mentioned data privacy there. Um, um, just interested in what the panel thinks of um, the GDPR um, in the, the, the new regulation on that area in the European Union. Um, I, I don't know, Ben, you want to chip in here because from, um, uh, from certain perspectives, the US, we talked about the US market and its challenges and, you know, maybe Europe and other places look more attractive from the cryptocurrency point of view. Or, but to what extent does GDPR, do, do, do people in the sector see it as a kind of something that's really restrictive or too restrictive, or do they see it as a kind of an enabling thing? I, that's a good question. I, I, think, I think it remains to be seen, at least in the US. I mean, you've now California has adopted its own right. mini GDPR, and um, we'll see if that continues to spread around um, the country. It wouldn't surprise me if a couple of other states did that. I assume the federal government won't do it because they can't seem to be able to do anything. They can't barely stay open. Uh, so, um, but uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure uh, uh, whether it will have a major impact. Obviously, uh, there, there are, I think it depends on the type of fintech you're talking about. There mm -hmm. are certainly fintech companies who rely a lot on big data and the ability to analyze data and the ability to rely on that data to do things that are more efficient than their incumbent counterparts. And if GDPR-like rules start to interfere with their ability to do that, um, that's obviously going to be something they're going to have to navigate. Yeah. Um, just, just on the cryptocurrency point there, I mean, what's, what is the, um, what is the most, from your perspective, what is the most attractive place if you were setting up a cryptocurrency? Uh, so I'm completely biased. Uh, I worked, let's, let's, uh, let's reveal uh, that. Just first. put that on the table. <laughs> uh, I worked obviously on the BitLicense, which is the New York regulatory scheme. It is a full regulatory scheme. Uh, and it goes a little bit to Richard's earlier point, which is we have a problem in the U.S. Our banking laws and rules were written, at least in New York, and I'm sure similar for the federal rules, around the time of the Civil War. Um, so they're very old. They're very antiquated. No one contemplated the Internet, <laughs> uh, let alone cryptocurrencies. So we put in a new licensing scheme in New York. Um, I think it's worked well. Uh, it was slow. Um, to get off the ground once we put it into place. But now there's a group of companies, uh, about 15 of them in, in New York, who are fully regulated top to bottom. I work at one of them, New York Digital Investment Group. Um, we have a custodian, we have a uh, execution arm, and we have an asset management arm. They're all fully regulated. We're as regulated as any bank. In fact, right. we, we have a trust license. Um, it took a lot of work, but we have it. And now, customers in New York and around the globe, frankly, can come to that entity and these other entities that have the license and trust that they know what they're getting. Um, again, it goes back to what I said about a race to the top. My hope is that more companies will want that New York license because they'll want to compete with the companies that now have it who are getting more and more trust because of the existence of the licensing scheme and that you have those licenses. Um, you know, we built in New York, uh, our business is an institutional one, um, and I think you're seeing more and more institutions now looking at the New York entities that have these licenses saying, maybe we can get into this now. This is interesting. Right. Uh, and um, I think ultimately that leads to further innovation and further competition towards the top. Okay. Can I just add to that? Because yeah. we rolled out our crypto spot exchange regime last year as well. So in rolling that out, going back to your question, what is the most attractive regime to set up? We decided we are not going there. Because in talking to institutional investors, there are a multitude of risks that has not been addressed properly in the crypto space. And if you don't address that, it's going to be a space dominated by professional investors and retail. Mm -hmm. And you're going to see a lot of volatility in any of those without institutional participation. So we went about in a very conscientious manner to address not only AML KYC risk, but also custody risk. Last year alone, you have a billion dollars worth of coins stolen. If you look at our cybersecurity technology governance risk, I think that's extremely important. Investor protection risk, and of course, market operations and market surveillance risk. So in our pronouncement, we always say that we are, we are high standards. It's very high watermark. 
We welcome people that are here for the long term, building this on a sustainable basis. Otherwise, you know, we prefer not to have our business. Mm. And we have a lot of interest. I must say we have a lot of interest. We have turned away many people because they can't meet those standards. Uh, even some of the largest exchanges in the world, when they come to us, they say, that's our modus operandi. Right? Take it or leave it. We say, no, but you're not suitable for us. We are not here for the short term. Mm. We're looking much longer term. If you want a market with integrity, with investors participating, including institutions, we need to build it well. And, uh, and we see a lot of strong support because of where we are, gravitating to the top, like what Ben say. I think it's possibly going to be a trend of the future. I think, Richard, just to build up and to, to your point earlier that you mentioned about Square, and I think what we're starting to see definitely in this region is regulators are not trying to understand how the technology works but just ensuring that the frameworks that they have meet AML, KYC, ensuring nothing you know, random happens. And I think it, exactly the same with cryptocurrencies because you, you see some other jurisdictions that jumped immediately and said, we will touch nothing to do with mm. cryptocurrencies or even crypto asset operator yeah. platform. And in my opinion, that's a very big mistake because that's a space which is still nascent, but there's a lot of innovations that are coming out there that, that are fundamentally change the way business is done. And so I think that shift, especially in looking, wearing that regulatory hat, has, has been extremely positive. Mm. Okay, so, so we've, got, we've kind of established this model or this, this ideal, platonic ideal of a, a regulator who kind of balances innovation equally with the financial stability. Um, if we're just kind of turning specifically to this region and um, trying to build, build up this hub. What, what things... Both of you, but anyone's willing to mm. can, can, can chip in. But what things need to be done, or what would to get you to that, you know, ideal, maybe even possible kind of ideal? But uh, what are the challenges, I suppose? So you spoke about regulatory sandbox. To me, that is the elementary step in terms of trying to build up something, because that is a statement of intent that you are willing to experiment, you are willing to understand the risks involved working very closely with the startups, firms that are going through fast-paced acceleration. So I think that is a good first step. But you really need the talent and resources internally. You need rules and regulations that are facilitative. Because if the rules and regulations get stuck uh, and never change, adapt to some of these new things, you never allow for some of this new innovation to come through. So on that front, other than the crypto exchange framework, we have come up with our statements on virtual currencies, how they are regulated, tokenization, uh, which is important going forward. And we are seeing a lot of those activities coming through because I think players know that we understand that. But in every stage of growth, the players will need support. And the financial institutions need support. If you look at it, the players need support in terms of having a conducive ecosystem. They need support in terms of deploying their solutions, they need the right partners, both in terms of investors, as well as financial institutions that can work with to adopt their solutions. And financial institutions want to change. Uh, a lot of times, they do not know where to start. Uh, in this region, you have some banks that don't even have proper APIs, right? Mm -hmm. How do you then adopt some of the technological solutions? How do you then encourage them, work with them? So, do you, do you, do you, when, when you encounter institutions like that, do you feel the need to kind of make sure they don't do anything rash then? Well, so, so that's what we're encouraging. Um, last year, we commenced a project on electronic KYC. So with some of the largest Abu Dhabi banks and money service providers to try to lower the cost of onboarding, allowing data to be properly shared, subject to control with regulatory participation. Because such shared utility have the potential benefit of lowering costs for everybody both for the consumers as well as for the financial institutions. And then we started experimenting cross-border. The API issue is a real issue. So if you look at what Singapore is building in terms of that front, it is bu building an API exchange, connecting Southeast Asia countries, allowing the banks to go to source for solutions within the sandbox and technology firms to go in to provide and to experiment with them. So we are doing the same for Middle East Africa region, connecting the banks in this region, especially those that possibly don't have proper APIs, as well as the uh, technology companies, right? But we, we do experiment on various fronts. 
working with the Singapore regulators and Hong Kong regulators on a global trade connectivity network, allowing trade finance, trade documentation to be done on blockchain, for instance. And I think that's massive, that's transformational, mm -hmm. allowing free flow of trade around the world on a much, much faster basis, more efficient basis. So I, I do think that other than just regulatory sandbox, other than just rules and regulations, a lot of cooperation cross-border um, because we have to try to grow the pie here. So, I mean, you mentioned mm. cooperation. This is part of this whole FCA that the UK regulators' original idea for kind of cross-border sandboxes to try and um, do what you're, what you're suggesting. Um, but what, it's what, not what, just cross-border sandboxes. I think, you know, I, I always say it, and, you know, we, we share a similar experience to ADGM, but also slightly different given that we're, mm -hmm. we're also onshore. It's the mindset. The mi I always say fintech is an ethos. It's a mindset that we need to do things extremely differently. And even whether it's within a sandbox or not, um, the way I view success of somebody in Bahrain is whether, you know, Bahrain's a small market. Somebody tests, incubates, ideates, goes live. Their success is if whether I can hold their hand, bring them right up to Abu Dhabi, they get that support they need, and I don't view it as a zero-sum game, whether they did end up setting up in Abu Dhabi or they did set, set up in Bahrain. And I think that's one thing that is fundamentally being shifted at the moment. I think the regulatory sandbox, as simple as this concept sounds, is, I think, significant in two ways. One, it sent a clear signal, especially from the regulators, when the regulator comes up and says this, that incumbents, uh, you no longer have a free playing field, you're no longer protected by me, and there are new kids on the block that mm. will add to that innovation that will help us pivot to this new world. Um, I think that was one, and two, it created that a bit of mindset that we need to start really looking at it, we need to start changing, and we probably need to start working with these individuals. And the region, and I think to a certain extent also in Singapore, uh, you know, it's, it's not the United States or China where you've got an abundance of tech talent that is available. So as you grow that indigenous industry, which we're also, I think, at the same time looking to improve the talent, having a mechanism which allows for that innovation and creativity is going to bring you innovators, which will ultimately benefit you as a jurisdiction and also help develop that future talent pipeline. I think for us what's happening in Bahrain is is important, and Richard, you know this as a regulator extremely well, is when our central bank governor goes up um, and says, we're going to do this, mm -hmm. and banks are not doing enough, people start listening. Um, and, and so over the last two years, a lot of the in initiatives have happened, and I think two significant ones are coming up, aside from the sandbox or standardized EKYC utility for the whole country, and open mm -hmm. banking. Obviously, open banking for a lot of banks, they start shivering. Mm. But I think what that has resulted in is um, banks seriously taking a look at changing um, because a lot of them probably won't be there in the, over the next five years. And you know, in the audience, obviously here we've got the head of FinTech from Bahrain. I see a local entrepreneur who's developed a single API for open banking. These things, I think, are, if we sat here last year or the year before, we wouldn't be talking about it. So I think. This mindset uh, is, is extremely imperative. Yeah, so. mm -hmm. Together we grow stronger. That's a message I always say, and it's, it's, we firmly think, believe uh, in that. I mean, if you, uh, this is, we're talking particularly here about fintech cooperation in, amongst regulators, but um, the history of um, kind of capital and liquidity cooperation between um, international regulators is not. I mean, it's they've they've achieved some things, but it's not. It's not like every um, every country has exactly the same um, capital liquidity, or so. And there's a reason for that. There's an obvious reason for that um, because people want to control control their own market. So, I mean, I just wondered, what, Ben, what do you what do you think about the, the the possibility that you know someone like the U.S. would actually want to? I mean, they've barely even got a, <laughs> a sandbox. Um, so. Do you think they'd ever like want to kind of cooperate in the way that we're talking about? Uh, I don't know that they'll ultimately have a choice. Um, right. I'm a firm believer that um, there is something fundamentally revolutionary happening driven by these new technologies 
and policymakers and regulators, politicians are all going to have a choice to make. They're either going to start really revving their engines to catch up to this, or they're going to be left way behind the rest of the globe. And um, so I, I think um, it's going to be a struggle and it's going to be messy, but um, I think you will ultimately see U.S. regulators and other global regulators having to figure out ways to collaborate, cooperate, and have more international standards. I mean, I remember when we did um, the bit license, I, some people didn't like it, and I would, had given a speech about it, came off the stage, was in the elevator, and I got confronted by a guy um, who said, who the heck are you, a New York regulator, to regulate something so global as Bitcoin? That's the term he used. And I looked at him and said, you're exactly right, um, but we have to do something until larger, more global regulators do it because we want to create a situation where we can have trusted institutions uh, who can operate in this space. And I think um, ultimately that's where it has to head. It has right. to become more global. Right. Uh, um, I think just to add to that point, I think people are waiting for that mega development where everybody gets together. But I think the secret is also in developing those bilateral relationships and not, sometimes not necessarily even with regulators, but the underlying ecosystem. Right. The moment you have that stronger bridge, that ultimately sometimes leads to, to others coming up and then that for that big bang effect to have and then the global regulation to come in. Mm. And just, to, just to, in the, from the kind of Gulf or MENA region um, perspective, is, is there a scope for you? I mean, are you looking at this whole GFIN cross-border cooperation as a, something you might start doing on a regional level first? Or, or are you already doing it? Um, how, how should we think about that? Because obviously, if it, from a global perspective, thinking about this region, they, they don't just think in terms of Abu Dhabi and, um, you know, and Bahrain and, and Saudi have also kind of um, launched their own sandbox. They think about it in the totality. So, is there scope for cooperation? Our position is we need many more centers, many more centers of activity, which is why ever since the first edition of our FinTech Summit, Abu Dhabi FinTech Summit, we hold on the sidelines a regulatory roundtable involving all the regional regulators to find ways to really support fintech, to work together on that front. And we share experiences quite freely. And I'm very glad to report when we first our, hold our first summit in 2017, um, the region was developing. Many, many central banks and regulators don't have sandbox, they don't have a roadmap on that front. By last year, which is our second edition, uh, things have changed quite drastically. So Bahrain is doing extremely well in that space. You have Saudi Arabia, which have just announced they're coming out with Sandbox. And we help them along. We, we share our knowledge quite freely. Mm -hmm. What should they be looking out for in terms of setting up that regime? Because we feel that you, you need a much bigger marketplace. And to do that, you need different regulators embracing this. Otherwise, the fintech providers who have very few marketplaces in which they can deploy and bring about adoption, the financial institutions that wish to adopt those. Mm. So by doing that, you create a much bigger marketplace, not only through the fintech bridges, but through corporate cooperation. So we have players in our regulatory sandbox, there's in the Bahrain sandbox, for instance, and that takes place even before GFIN came about. Uh, is because of that nature of collaboration, and trying to grow a bigger pie for everybody, right. to grow a much bigger critical mass. Otherwise, if you look at each indi individual market on its own, it might be quite small, right? Mm. You can't compare with the likes of North Asia or India and some other markets. But together, we will make much better sense. Okay, um, just uh, bring you in here, Marcelo. And just um, obviously, we're talking about we are basically talking about um, you know, the, the Abu Dhabi. Um, the the, um, the Bahrains, the Dubais, but is there any way in which this kind of, if there was a, a much bigger hub here that could benefit the other parts of MENA, mm. the north and the, the, the NAR bit of the, of the MENA? Um, because it, uh, there might be a way if it's not just, they, they might not be the hubs, but they could sure. still benefit, right? Sure. Well, let me say, I hope they do. You know, it's interesting because we are talking about here the fine-tuning of sandbox regulation. But at the same time, in MENA, there are 140 million adults 
that do not have bank accounts. This is the lowest level of financial inclusion in the world as a rate. Um, so how do you balance it? Sandbox, fine tuning versus just getting a bank account to a person. Um, now, the good news, and here is where the low-hanging fruit for business is, is that 80% of the 140 million adults in MENA that don't have, that don't have bank account, 80% of those have a mobile phone. Okay? Uh, as it happened, only 33% of them ever made or received a digital payment. Right. When the rest of the developing world, including Africa, is more like 50%, and you know, hey, rich economies is about 95%. So you have both. You have the mobile phone in your hand and very low digital payment. So when we really look at how do we kickstart the thing, we found three sources that I want to mention because they may not apply quite to the GCC because you are sandboxing here, but for the rest of MENA and the links between the two, I think it's important. Uh, the three places to push, one is most governments in the Middle East do cash transfers for social assistance or equalization purposes. So they transfer money to a person. Uh, most of them also do agricultural subsidies. Uh, sometimes for water, sometimes for uh, fertilizer, but they do, they do it in cash. And then you have a large portion of the private employers who pay wages in cash. Okay? Now, we calculate that about 90% of those who receive either a government transfer of a private wage and um, who don't have a bank account, 90% of those have a mobile phone, okay? About farmers is 70%. So just by changing the policy of how do you deliver the cash to the individual, you force, Sorry. You force a fintech revolution because you suddenly bring all this market into, into play. Um, let me give you another example. Um, India, in five years, biometrically identified more than a billion people at $4 per pop. Somebody shines light into your eyes, the light comes back with the information of retina, of your retina, goes up to a satellite, down to a mainframe, and then you exist univocally forever. And if you, don't ex if you didn't exist before, existing must be a great feeling because people queue to do this. Now, it was immediate for the, for this is an other program in India. It was immediate for the government to say, now we are going to transfer all the subsidies through this, through mobile phones. Uh, and India became very soon a fintech hub, right? So I think we have places to kickstart the laggards, if you want. Right. Uh, and let me finish on the, on the issue of the so cutting edge regulation, in this case for some boxes. I don't think you can do it regionally, define it, that geography that I mentioned before. You still have to do it supranationally, but it may be better to start with the GCC, not with the whole MENA region, because of these huge disparities in uh, financial penetration. No? Right, okay. I'm um, just going to see if anyone um, fancies answering any questions. Um, well, a forest of hands, Sheila. Um, we've, we've only got um, a short period of time, but um, would you like to start here? Hi, Khalid Halader, um, Blossom Finance. Uh, regulatory jurisdiction question. Where you've got a fintech based in your jurisdiction but doesn't take funds from citizens in your jurisdiction, so, so a crowdfunding or a peer-to-peer -peer lending, in your location, but only takes money from international. Does that fall, whose domain does that fall under in terms of regulation? So they're not, they're not taking money from US citizens, but they're based in the US. But because it's an internet, it's a global platform, you might have money coming in from Argentina or Zimbabwe, etc. They're not your retail customers, but do you have any oversight or any role in that sort of regulation? Yeah, so, um you know, we took the view in New York that we got you either way. If you were based in New York as a company, even though you didn't have New York customers, now that didn't happen too often, but if it did happen, hypothetically, we would have jurisdiction because you're operating as a business in New York, engaging in whatever type of banking activity we regulated. Um, alternatively, if you were based in Delaware or some other location, but you had a lot of customers in New York and you were operating a customer business that affected New York investors or, uh, you know, and from a retail perspective, um, we also thought we had jurisdiction there as well, and that's how we did it. Some people thought we were broad in our reach, and we probably were, but that's, that was our view. We were there to regulate the businesses, and we were also there to protect the citizens of New York. 
So if you, if you want to operate in one jurisdiction and represent that you're licensed in that, that jurisdiction, the regulator of that jurisdiction will need to take accountability and oversight over you, regardless of where you expand to or whether you take money from that jurisdiction or not. Because by virtue that you're going out to market, that you're being licensed by, let's say, uh, a regulator in, in, in one country, that itself requires proper licensing, proper oversight, and proper supervision. So, so. Okay, well, there were two questions over. We've only got time for two, really. But um, maybe the one over there first. Hey, hey guys, this is uh, Jackson Mueller. I head our financial technology program at the uh, Milken Institute. So thank you, Bo, uh, thank you all for uh, joining the panel discussion today. It's been fantastic from a fintech policy wonk uh, perspective. So uh, two questions. Uh, actually, I'll keep it to one question real quick. Um, in the MENA region in particular, do you anticipate certain countries to specialize in a certain subset of fintech, whether it be AI, payments, uh, lending, or you know, are they all just going to, are all the, the countries in the MENA region just going to go, hey, fintech, come in and you know, we'll, we'll figure out regulations around you, or is there going to be a specific focus on a, on a particular fintech company or fintech uh, subset. Thank you. My own take, it doesn't quite happen in that fashion in the MENA region. It can happen in some other regions, uh, which I've seen. For example, certain parts of Canada is known for very good AI. Right? Um, but I don't quite see that, uh, really because a lot of activities here, especially in the regulated space, they are very dependent on regulations and how adaptive and how flexible and how fast-moving those regulations are. So it tends to gravitate towards certain areas where you, you have the regulators and the ecosystem in place that is supportive of that particular activity. And you know, for the entire fintech space, is all the different pillars within that particular fintech activity. So it just doesn't quite happen in one sliver of a space. I think Jackson, just to, to add up on Richard, it's, it's better to, 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 to leave abroad, especially as you're starting from a relatively lower base. And then as that base or foundation starts to develop, you might end up with, with specialization. Obviously, some other jurisdictions have been known to be specialists in certain areas, whether cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, or other areas. But I think in our region, it's, it's better to develop that base first by you know, keeping it broad rather than just restricting it to a certain vertical. And if you end up specializing during that process, then I think that's, that's an extra added bonus on top. Okay, mm -hmm. excellent. And just last question over there then. Just a question to Richard. Sandbox, onshore, offshore, um, federal, state, can you just shed light more on what that roadmap looks like all the way to commercialization? of a company entering a sandbox onshore, offshore, and how does it work that, uh, here in the UAE? There's no onshore and offshore. There's onshore and free zone. Offshore has a very negative terminology to it, right? So it's onshore and free zone. Uh, what we have done is the sandbox for the financial free zone in Abu Dhabi itself. Uh, we do have things like passporting arrangement. For example, we have we have a passporting arrangement with the Securities and Commodities Authority. So if you're in that space, uh, we will coordinate with the regulatory agencies accordingly. Depends on what you want to do. Uh, in, in certain space, actually, the onshore free zone distinction is not that stark, uh, really, in, in financial services. So there are certain prohibition on things like deposit taking, but that doesn't extend to many other areas. Okay, well, we're out of time now. I'd um, just like to thank all the columnists there, the panellists, rather, for um, uh, their interesting views and uh, helpful pastor analogies. Um, uh, let's um, leave it there, but thanks for attending. <laughs>